All right, so first of all, exam three. Exam three is going to be over chapters five and six. There's no math in this exam. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe you're going, yay, or maybe you're like, oh. <laughs> no math on this exam. It's really, this chapter is about like chemical reactions. What are the some of the factors that make chemical reactions happen? And then... The sort of center part are all the different types of chemical reactions that we're going to really talk about for the rest of the semester. And then we kind of finish it up talking about lipids. So if you read in the e-text, the lipids were actually like introduced in chapter four, but then they talk about them again in chapter five. And I'm not a big fan of like splitting up like big topics like that. So I'm like, we're just going to put all of that into chapter five material because I felt like chapter four had enough material as it was. <laughs> so I was like, we're just going to stick and worry about the isomers and the, all of that in chapter four. So we're going to cover really lipids completely in chapter five. And then chapter six is all about carbohydrates. So this exam is really going to be going over reactions, but then the two of the three big nutrient groups, both fats, oils, or lipids, and then carbohydrates. And then further on, we're going to talk about protein. So we'll end up covering all of those major molecules that you use for food and nutrients. Okay. So I will give you a note card again. So this one, I would really encourage you to start making a list of things that you want to try to organize on what you're going to put on that note card. If you try to do that after the lecture, instead of like waiting till just before the exam, you may find things like kind of are still a little more fresh in your head, I would encourage you not to try and put it on the note card straight away because you might run out of room. But instead, just start making like a notebook or a, a loose leaf paper list of things that you're like, okay, I got to remember that this is this and this is how I see this and this is how you find that. So being able to then be able to pick things out if you're going to need to have that information for that note card. All right. So the first part of this, they call it thermodynamics, which makes it sound super fancy. So really all it's talking about is like the amount of energy that's involved in chemical reactions. So remember that energy is the ability to do work. And we talked about a number of different forms that energy can have, electrical energy, nuclear energy, chemical energy, mechanical energy. So we mentioned all of those in the beginning. When you look at your snack food or your drink or any type of food that, that you buy that's prepared, it always comes with like a calorie content. So there's a nutrition label that kind of breaks down what's in that food. So they always talk about calories. So notice that that calories is a capital C calories. It really means that it's a kilocalorie. So food calories are typically in large scale calories. And the calorie represents the amount of energy that you get out of that nutrient when you break it down. So when you form bonds, that typically requires energy because that's more of a building kind of activity. But when you break things down, breaking links between, that is going to release that energy. So when you think about energy content in food, that's what is going to release energy We'll talk a little bit about different ways that that happens in this chapter. So the first part is like, well, why do reactions actually occur? Like what is the sort of rule for energy effects and whether or not a reaction happens? So there's a couple of factors that are gonna determine if a reaction can occur. So the first one has to do with the heat exchange in the reaction. So if you have a reaction that releases heat or you have a reaction that requires heat, which one do you think would be easier to get to happen? One that you have to put heat in or one that's going to give heat out? Heat out. Because you don't have to do anything, right? If heat's released, then that means I don't have to put heat in. Okay? So that is actually considered an exothermic reaction. So remember, exo is like to come out. Thermic, think of heat. So exothermic is heat coming out. Look at 
in this reaction, do you see that if heat is released, it's kind of like heat is a product. So you're going to put it on, it would be put on the right side. If they were going to give it a value of energy, it's always a negative number if heat is released. The term that they used for this is called enthalpy. This is this heat energy that is released or used in a reaction. And the little shorthand or the symbol that they use for it is they just call it delta H. That is that change in heat energy. So I learned this when I had to take, like I have a lot more details with this, but I could always remember enthalpy from entropy, which is the next one, because enthalpy has an H in it. So the word enthalpy has an H. So that's how you can remember that that's talking about heat, which starts with an H. And that also tells you that's talking about enthalpy. And if heat is released, then it's coming out. So delta H is always going to be a negative number. If heat is absorbed like the one below, then it's considered an endothermic. So endo means to go in, exo means to come out. So endothermic means that heat is getting absorbed in the reaction. So if heat has to go in, then that delta H is a positive number. So as a general rule, if I compare these two, reactions that are going to release heat are always more favorable, which means that there's more, the chances are greater that that reaction will happen all on its own than a reaction that you've got to put heat into. So I always think of this, this is like cooking. A couple nights ago, I made a meatloaf. Okay, so you like mix all of this stuff together, you put it in the pan, you can't just leave it on the counter, it's not going to cook on its own, right? That is a reaction that's not spontaneous. It is not just going to cook on its own. Now it will rot on its own if I just left it there for days and days and days. But what do I have to do? You've got to put it in the oven, okay? So putting it in the oven is going to give heat to speed up the breakdown of the nutrients that are in the food till it gets to the point that you've actually killed any bacteria that's in there and then it's safe to eat, which is really one of the big reasons why you cook food. <laughs> it's not, I mean, yes, it, I think it maybe tastes better, you know, but some people, I guess, might like eating raw hamburger, but that just sounds really unappetizing to me. So that's really the point of cooking because cooking helps to soften food. Cooking helps to make sure that any living microbes that might be in that food are actually dead. And so that food is now safe to eat. That's not going to happen on its own. So that is an endothermic reaction. That process, I have to put heat in in order for that food to be cooked. The one of giving heat out. So think of our burning nuts. And if you aren't in lab, just think about burning wood. Okay, so you do light it, so you do have to give it a heat source, but it becomes a self-sustaining thing. So when you lit the nut, so in lab, we had different types of nuts that we put on this little nut stand, and we lit them, and they burned until they were little black ash pieces. Some people's like disintegrated, fell apart, fell all over everywhere, it was kind of a mess. But burning those nuts, they give off a lot of heat. Burning fuels, good examples of these exothermic reactions. So these are more favorable. As long as I have that fuel, the burning keeps going. So if you light a fire in the fireplace and you just keep feeding it wood, feeding it wood, it is self-sustaining because it is so exothermic that there's enough heat energy to be able to continue the reaction as long as you have enough fuel present. So more favorable is if heat is given off. The other thing that really affects whether or not a reaction is likely to occur is what they call entropy. So the way you can remember entropy is entropy is talking about order. So order, by order I mean like how organized the reactant is versus the product. So if I start off with 10 small pieces and then I build it into one thing, that becomes more ordered. So by building larger structures, that is 
a an increase. Sorry, it's a, a increase in entropy. If I break things down, though, that breaking bonds, which typically is exothermic, that that is also going to then create more disorder, and that's always more favored. More disorder. And there's sort of like a whole chaos theory that this all kind of is derived from. So this is this idea that the entire universe is always moving towards disorder. Things are tending to want to spread about. So in my life, I can like make the, the analogy of what our house was like when my children were in their teens. <laughs> okay, so what do you do over the weekend? So you do laundry, right? You do the dishes, you put everything away, you sweep, you vacuum. And you're like, okay, usually like Sunday Things are like kind of in some sort of order. And then what happens during the week? Chaos, right? So during the week, because of the rush, because you don't have time to like stop and do all of the things that you might do if you had more time, then you would start finding like socks in the living room. Then you would find like cereal bowls in the bathroom. I don't even know how this got here, right? You're like, why is there a fork in the car? Well, I brought the fork because I was eating this and then I forgot about it. So it stayed in the car. So that's disorder, right? So you go and organize, you put all the silverware in the silverware drawer, all the cups go in the cup drawer, <laughs> cup shelves, right? You get everything organized, all the clothing gets put away, but then over time you get to this chaos. So then you have to stop and spend a lot of effort in order to reorganize. So that doesn't happen automatically, right? Disorder happens automatically. Order requires a lot of effort. That sort of cleaning and organizing and having things in their little spaces. So this is really entropy. So in looking at the first one, so in this first one, if I'm going from something that's aqueous, that Na2, NaC2H3O, so that sodium acetate. So having that in its aqueous form, what are those molecules doing if they're aqueous? That means they're in what? water. So these molecules are floating, okay, versus changing it to a solid. So if a so if it's a solid, how is that arrangement changed? Is it more ordered or less? More ordered, right? Because now all these little molecules are going to line up in a row. They're all going to get really close together. Solids are more ordered than liquids. So you would say that this, for this first one, that there's more order. So our delta A, a delta S, sorry, Delta S is going to be a negative number. But then looking at the bottom one, so that one with aluminum carbonate breaking down into aluminum oxide and carbon dioxide, starting with just one thing and ending up with four. Do you see how I have like one Al2CO33? And then over on the product side, I have one Al2O3 and three CO2s. So what did I do to the disorder? I went from having one thing and now I have four. So what happened to the disorder? Did it increase or decrease? Increased, right? I have more products. Taking up more space spreading out, not being organized like in that Al2CO33. And so this is more disorder. So my delta S is positive. So if heat is given off, your delta H is negative. If my, my reaction becomes more ordered, my delta S is negative. So disorder is always more favored, just like heat being released in a reaction, that's more favored. Being more disordered is more favored as well. So they are kind of looking at this and trying to figure out, well, if I have these two reactants, why do I mix them together and they react? But then if I have these other two reactants, I put them together and nothing happens. Like, what is the difference between? That's really where this was kind of like being studied. Why are some reactions? Why do some reactions happen? Why do some reactions not happen? Why do I have to like add a whole lot of heat to another reaction to get it to happen? So there was a, a scientist, Dr. Gibbs, that studied this. This was sort of his life work. And he came up with this sort of analogy that said, reactions will, will happen. They're much more favorable or spontaneous. So just think of spontaneous. 
and favorable, when you think of a reaction, that means they're just more likely to happen. Because he was really trying to define what is the energy differences that's going to determine if a reaction occurs. So he said it is because of heat and order. It's those two factors along with the temperature that the reaction is at is going to determine whether or not a reaction occurs. And I don't expect you to like, we're not going to actually use numbers like that's like a three to four week lecture in a general chemistry class. So we're not going to do that. But instead, we're just sort of looking at like, how does this come about? So we said delta H, so that's enthalpy. Delta H, if it's a negative number, right? So if this is a negative number because heat is released, and if entropy, entropy, if it's a positive number, which creates more disorder, do you see that my delta G would be a big negative number? So a negative number minus another negative number would end up, or sorry, minus a positive number would give me a big negative number. So he found if delta G is negative, then I'm going to have a spontaneous reaction, a reaction that's going to occur. I don't have to put any energy in. I just have to put the reactants together and it'll happen. So my example is things that happen naturally, wood rotting, okay? So if you have wood and you have like a little stack of wood, the wood at the bottom, which typically like gets used the least because you oftentimes like stack stuff on top and then you go down and then you put more on top. So it's those bottom pieces that seem like they get like used the least. Over time, they're exposed to the elements, they're exposed to normal environmental temperatures and they begin to break down. So that wood just kind of gets softer and softer and then it almost starts looking like little, little wood chips. It just starts breaking up. You go to pick it up and it just disintegrates in your hands. That is because it becomes more disordered by breaking down and it slowly releases heat. So it's an exothermic reaction just in that normal decomposition of the wood. So when things break down, things like rotting, the normal process, those are typically gonna be spontaneous. We can speed it up if we heat it, right? So if you heat that wood, you could speed up the breakdown process, but it'll happen at normal temperatures. But on the other side, Building muscle is a good example of a reaction that is not spontaneous because you cannot lay on the couch and build muscle. If you lay on the couch, you lose muscle, <laughs> okay? So if you don't, if you're not actively trying to build muscle, you're not gonna maintain it and it's not gonna get greater. So delta H requires, it's an endothermic reaction, which means that I have to put heat energy in I'm building muscle, which means I'm taking small pieces and I'm building larger structures. That's going to create more order. So both of those are like require more work. So in that, that delta G then, since delta H is a positive number and delta S is a negative number, minus a negative number is the same thing as adding a number because minus a minus, is they cancel each other out. That's why that delta G number becomes a positive that's not spontaneous and will require a lot of work to make it happen. So kind of like their analogy that they did in this one. So the first one, that's the canoe going downstream. So is that a spontaneous process or not? Yeah, spontaneous. You put the canoe in, you sit, you don't paddle or anything. You just float along with the current, right? So it's just floating. So notice they don't have to paddle. So it's a spontaneous process. And this is kind of like reactions that have a negative delta G that have an exothermic, exothermic reactions that create more disorder. They're more like thinking of, think of them, that wood rotting. They're gonna happen on their own. The other one though, are these people trying to paddle upstream. I don't know if you've ever tried to do this. 
It's not a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. So if you want that canoe to go upstream, the only way that you're going to make that happen is to do what? Paddle really hard. Use a lot of energy. That represents reactions that could happen, but they're not going to happen spontaneously. They're going to require a lot of energy input. These are the non-spontaneous processes. These are the reactions that are endothermic. You have to put heat in. And they're reactions that make things more ordered, requiring a lot of work. So they also put these in kind of like a graph or a chart to show the flow of energy in a reaction. And so we're just gonna use like a generic reaction of A plus B, it's gonna combine and A and B are gonna to be together. Okay, so you have A and B and they're just combining in this reaction. So in this reaction, if you look at both of these charts, the first chart, do you see where the energy of the reactants is? So the energy of the reactants of A and B compared to the energy of the product, or sorry, it's A, B. The energy of the product, which has a higher energy? The reactants. So if you looked up on that vertical side, you see the vertical side is the energy level. So A and B start off with more energy. There is always a certain amount of energy you have to put into a reaction for it to take place. That energy is sort of this hill. So I always think of it like the little hill. They call it the activation energy, but it's always a certain amount of energy that's gonna be required for a reaction to occur. It might be very small or it might be really steep, but there's a certain amount of energy that always ends up being put in. But then what do you notice in this first one about the energy level of the products? They are much lower than the energy of the reactants. So I put in this much energy, but I got out this. So this is an example of a reaction that has an, an energy released in the reaction. They call it exer, exergonic, which just means again, energy out. Like exo, exothermic is heat out, but exergonic would be energy out. That difference in energy is really that delta G. Since energy is released in this, because there's more energy released than energy that was initially present, that's your spontaneous process. So spontaneous reactions have products with less energy than reactants. But then look at the hill on the one on the right. So here, A and B are here, and C, not C, that's what I always think about it. A and B combined, do you see that the reactants have less energy? So I have to put a lot of energy in that activation energy, the hill of energy I've got to get over is much greater, giving me a really high activation energy. And I actually don't get all that energy back out. My products have more energy than the reactants do so they say in this reaction, you're actually losing energy. Energy has to go into the reaction to make it happen. So that's why they call it ender, right? So ender is in, exer is out. So endergonic is where energy is absorbed. In a reaction. And if you look at that delta G, you see it's positive. That would represent a non-spontaneous reaction because if I want this reaction to occur, I'm gonna have to constantly put energy in because I'm not gonna get any out. 
Whereas with the first one, if I put a little bit of energy in, I get enough out that it can actually power the next reaction. And I can have it go again, and it can power that sort of like lighting the nut or lighting the piece of wood. Once you get it lit, it just self-sustains. There's enough energy released that it's going to continue the reaction as long as I have reactants available for it to occur. So this first one's a good example of a spontaneous reaction. The second one's the non-spontaneous. So when thinking about activation energy, it's really two things, two criteria that come into play with this activation energy. This is the energy that's needed to get molecules to collide. Right, so I need the reactants to collide. Reactions can't happen unless things come together. So they physically have to come together. If you have a low activation energy, that means that you might have them colliding a lot. Okay, so it may be very simple collisions that comes into effect, but this, this image shows it's not just collisions, it's also the orientation. So it's the orientation of the reactants as well. I mean, I just think of like Legos. So like Legos, if you put two Legos side by side, do they stick together? No, you got to stack them, right? And so it's the orientation. You can't put the bottoms together. They don't stick together. You can't put the tops together. They don't stick together. You've got to like stack them so that they match the little blocks. So the little pieces fit down and they click together. And that creates like the stable structure. So it's an orientation thing, right? So it's, you've got to have them stacked. They can be offset, but they have to come top to bottom so that they snap together. So when you see in this one with the left, if A and B come together and they don't fit together, then nothing happens. So that reaction, A and B, they have A kind of this way, B being this way. If they hit, they just bounce off of each other. So if orientation is super important and some molecules only fit together in a very specific way, then if they don't line up exactly right, then they won't react. So those reactions are going to have a high activation energy because orientation is super specific. But there are some molecules, though, where it doesn't really matter. <laughs> if they're this way, this way, this way, this way, it doesn't matter. They can react as long as they come in contact with each other. Okay, their shape is such that they just fit together automatically, they're going to have a low activation energy. It's not going to require as much energy to get them to fit together. As long as they touch, the reaction happens. So some of that's due to the shape of the molecule. Some of it's due to the type of bonds those molecules have. So some molecules will react much easier than others. Those two factors, though, that we need them to collide and we got to get them to collide in the right orientation. Those are the two things that determine what an activation energy is. Determine if it's a little hill or if it's a really big hill. So we can change, and we're not going to talk about these, we can change how fast reactions occur by changing conditions that can affect the activation energy. So when they talk about what's called kinetics, so kinetics is just how fast do reactions occur. So they also call it a rate. Kinetics is the speed. So like in lab this week, we had a reaction, we had to let it heat in a water bath for 15 minutes, okay? Because in 15 minutes, we, we, would, be, we would be sure that all of our reactants formed product. Some reactions can take place in less than a second. Some reactions may actually take hours. So we can change these in a couple of ways. So in this illustration sort of shows three different ways you can change the rate of a reaction, change the speed that reactions occur in. So A, is really just showing you a normal reaction without anything changed. So we will have A is going to be the large blue ball in all of these. Oh. B is going to be 
the little red one. And then AB is the one where they have combined together. So do you see the one that looks like this? So we're getting A plus B combining to make AB combined. Okay, so the single blues, those are A's. The red ones are B's. The ones where they're together, that's AB. So in this first one, it says, all right, if I take A and B and I put them in this container, within a minute, we'll just say within some designated period of time, do you see that I have one molecule of product? Okay, so you just see one. So normal, in one minute, I have one AB. So in another minute, maybe I'll have two. Another minute, I have three. Okay, so that's the speed. But how did B, first off, looking at B, how many products do you see? Two. So we're going to say it's the same period of time. This is also in a minute. So I have more product. So that means this reaction must have happened faster. I have sped up the rate. So how did they do it? With? Fire with heat, okay? So we're going to add heat. So that is what that represents, the little flame. So I'm going to heat the molecules up. When you look at the molecules in the container, what does it look like they're doing? Can you see they look kind of like they're moving? So they have this little sort of like smear behind them to kind of get them looking like when you heat molecules, remember heating causes them to vibrate. So by heating them, they vibrate faster. So if they're vibrating faster, what's that going to do in terms of that activation energy? Is that going to make them have the right orientation or is it just going to make them collide more? It's going to make them collide, right? So if you're like moving like this and you might bounce off of each other, but if you're moving faster, the odds are you're going to hit each other more, more collisions is going to lower the activation energy, okay? It's going to help get those molecules to come in contact. So adding heat is going to increase movement of molecules in the container, and that's going to increase collisions. And that speeds up my rate. That is why I have two products instead of just one compared to the very first container. So now tell me, how is the third container different from the first? It just has more. More what? More of A and B, right? So first container, you can see that the third container definitely has more molecules. So in this one, I've increased the concentration. I've put more reactants in that container. I don't, it doesn't look like they're zooming around, so it doesn't look like B. They're just in there. So they're like moving around, but because there's more of them, are they going to increase in collisions or increase in orientation? What do you think? If there's more of them, they're going to bounce off of each other more just because there's more of them? Like you think about like if there's only like five people in the room and you're moving around, odds are you're not going to run into each other. But what happens when you fill the room and you're trying to move around? Then you're like, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, right? You've got to like maneuver around. The odds are you're going to have more collisions. So by increasing the density of the reactants, I'm going to increase the odds of collisions. And remember that that's what affects the activation energy. So by making them come into contact with each other more, that's going to increase my rate. And how many products do you see? Instead of one in a minute, this one has, I see four, right? So this one increases the rate fourfold. Now I've got four products in the same period of time. So you can heat things to make those molecules move faster. That can speed up reactions. We can put more together to speed up reactions. Now the last one. So the last one has this odd little thing. It's a green little thing that looks kind of like a funny little cup. This is a catalyst. So just from this illustration, what is the catalyst doing? Okay, so notice like the catalyst, the little green cup thing. In some cases it has a blue. There's one where it has a red. 
but three of them, it's actually got them combined. So it's helping to bring those reactants together. And it's really the job of a catalyst. It will put reactants together in the right orientation. So not only is it going to cause them to collide, it's going to set them together exactly the way they need to be for the reaction to take place. So catalysts will lower an activation energy because they take the orientation factor out of play. Because if catalyst is like, okay, this one and this one, they got to line up like this to make them react. Well, I'm going to get this one, I'm going to get this one, I'm going to put them right on top of each other. So they're in the exact right position to be able to, rea to react together. That is going to speed up the rate as well. And so you're in lab, we made aspirin this week. And one of the things that we did, one, we heated the reaction. Okay, so we actually did B. We heated the reaction to get those molecules to move faster, to get them to collide more often. That was one part of the reason why we only had to wait 15 minutes for the reaction to occur. But the other thing that we did is we added sulfuric acid to the reaction mixture because it created an acidic environment, which acted as a catalyst to get our two reactants to come together faster. And so it only took 15 minutes, and I told you in lab, that if we hadn't added the catalyst, we would have needed to heat this for about two hours. So the reaction would occur on its own, but adding that catalyst greatly sped up how quickly those reactants were able to come together and form our product. So just a little bit about catalysts. We'll talk about catalysts again because almost all catalysts in biological systems are proteins. So when we get to the protein chapter, we'll kind of mention it again. But the catalyst big ability is this, this image down at the bottom is a great example of what an enzyme can do. So enzymes are biological catalysts. And what enzymes do is they have the ability to interact sometimes with one reactant, sometimes with two, sometimes with three or four. So they bring reactants together in the right orientation. So if you look at that first one, so that blue shape is the enzyme. And you kind of see it's got this really specific pattern, almost like a little jigsaw puzzle pattern. So the reactants specifically fit into the shape of the enzyme. So the green one only fits into the enzyme in that one position. The orangey yellow one also fits in that one position, but you see how that puts them together so that they're exactly like snug, okay? That they match just like a jigsaw puzzle that they fit perfectly together. And that enzyme then by bringing them together in the right orientation, they will allow that reaction to happen much faster. So especially in a reaction that is an unfavorable reaction, you can add an enzyme or a catalyst and that can help lower your activation energy so you don't have to use as much energy to get the reaction to occur. So if this is like the normal before, if I add a catalyst, my activation energy is going to be lower. So I can lower the amount of energy because it's bringing those reactants together in the right orientation. In the body, living systems rely on enzymes to be able to speed up reactions sometimes a million times faster. So if you were just trying to wait for things to break down in your GI tract, like you would be waiting for it to basically decompose or rot. You can't wait that long. So instead you have enzymes that break them down. Those enzymes then allow your food nutrients to become completely processed and broken down in the span of six to eight hours. Otherwise it would actually take days. And if it took days, you wouldn't be able to get the energy quick enough to be able to respond to changes in your environment. And there is no way that we would be able to be this big. We would not be able to be trillions of cells in size. We're like mammals and animals or some of the more complicated, more complex living systems. And so without enzymes, there's no way we would exist the way that we do. So here's another example. So this one 
if I want A and B to make C, so just like doing this little synthesis type of reaction, combining them, and the shape of A and the shape of B, I kind of had them drawn. So A looks like this, B looks like this, right? They have their specific shape. There is an enzyme potentially that is, that is produced that complements or fits just like a lock and a key that fits the shape of those reactants. So in mine, the little squiggly line, because enzymes are typically proteins, so this enzyme has this specific shape. And that shape allows A to slide into place, B to slide into place. But in my other example up there, if I wanted D and E to combine and form F, do you see that there's no way D and E would fit? Because of the shape of the enzyme, it only can interact with molecules that have a shape that fits into those little spots, their active sites. Anything with a different shape, nothing happens. So in this, by A and B combining, the enzyme is able to put them together in the right orientation so the reaction speeds up. The neat thing is, is as soon as the reaction is done, the product gets released and the enzyme returns to its original position and it can do this again. So catalysts don't just speed up a reaction one time. This enzyme, as long as I have A and B, this enzyme can take A and B and make C, take A and B and make C, take A and B and make C. It can just continue to do this until there's no more A and B. So it's not a one-time use. That is why they say that catalysts are not used up in the reaction. They just help to bring reactants together in the right orientation to help speed up the reaction. So I have an example at the bottom. So this is in digestion. So you have carbohydrates, you have proteins, you have lipids or fats, and you've got to process them in order to absorb them. They're all too big, other than sugars. All of them are too big. Once they hit your mouth, they've got to be broken down into smaller pieces. So you have digestive enzymes that do that. And these digestive enzymes are specific to the nutrient type. So in your saliva, you have an enzyme that starts the breakdown of starch. Starch is a poly polysaccharide. It's a carbohydrate of many, many glucose units in long chains. You can't absorb it because it's too big. In fact, you really don't even taste it. If you've ever gotten flour on your tongue, it just tastes pasty. It doesn't taste, taste sweet, salty, sour, or bitter. It just has kind of a pasty taste to it. And that's because it's so big. You can't even taste it, much less absorb it. But the enzyme that is in your saliva, called amylase, starts to chop the bonds between those sugars. And so it starts to take this huge, multiple thousands of molecule size complex and starts to clip them into smaller and smaller pieces. So then you start having just maybe a thousand and then there's just a couple of hundreds in size and then they're broken down so there's only maybe a hundred glucoses. So you get ends up with lots of smaller, smaller, smaller pieces and that's all this enzyme does is it just goes and chops them, okay? So it's just like goes up where the two glucose units are linked together in the long chain, it can then break that chain. And then it goes and it breaks this chain and it breaks this chain. So it just keeps doing it, keeps doing it. On the other hand though, proteins not affected by that enzyme. So there's proteins in like, so if you eat a burger, right? So you got a bun. So that's what amylase starts working on the bun because that's made of starch, that's your flour. But the burger is made of protein. And so start or amylase, the enzymes in the saliva have no effect. They're different shapes. That is not gonna get processed until you get down into the stomach. So when protein hits the stomach, you have two things that come into play. There's hydrochloric acid, which is stomach acid that gets secreted. Stomach acid speeds up the reaction that, is, that occurs because of another enzyme that then can recognize a long chain, of pro, a long chain of amino acids, a big protein, and it starts to work on that chain. So it then goes along the chain and just can, starts to break the chain into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces until eventually all of these get down to the smallest units, whether they're amino acids or glucoses, and then they can get absorbed. So they're extremely specific. And if you're missing any of these types of enzymes, then you end up with a disease.
A lot of diseases are genetic, which means you inherit them from your parents. One that is not as bad as all of the others, but still not great, is lactose intolerance. So lactose intolerance is what happens when your pancreas doesn't make the enzyme lactase. So this is the name of the enzyme, and it comes from your pancreas. So this enzyme, the only thing that it works on is lactose. So it takes the sugar lactose, and where do you find lactose? Lactose is called what? Yeah, milk sugar, okay? So it's commonly referred to as milk sugar. So anything that's a dairy product has lactose in it. So that would be cheese, sour cream, milkshakes, ice cream, any milk, cream, all of that contains lactose. This lactose is just what they call a disaccharide. It's only two sugars linked by a little bond. And what this enzyme does is it breaks it. So it takes lactose and it splits it into glucose and galactose. And these two sugars are small enough they get absorbed. So this comes from the pancreas. This gets dumped into your small intestine. So when you drink milk, glug, 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 so it goes down, nothing starts in the mouth because there's no lactase. Not to this, it's sugar. Goes in the stomach, nothing happens to lactose in the stomach because you don't have this enzyme. It's not until food gets into the small intestine. When it gets into the small intestine, you have pancreatic juice that gets dumped into the small intestine and it contains this enzyme. And this enzyme immediately goes and breaks the link between the two little sugars. Those two sugars are now small enough, they get absorbed. Okay, boom, that's it, that's all, you're done. That gets digested, it gets absorbed, now it's in your bloodstream and you can use it for energy. But if you don't make this enzyme, then this doesn't get broken. So this reaction does not happen. Lactose stays in the small intestine, it can't get absorbed unless it gets broken down into single sugar units. So it moves along and it's not a problem in the small intestine moving along, moving along down the small intestine because you know that's like 18 feet. So it finally gets all the way into the small intestine and ends up getting dumped into the large intestine. That's where the problems begin. <laughs> because in the large intestine, you have millions and millions of microscopic what? Bacteria. That is your natural flora. So it's estimated that there's about a thousand different kinds. It's not just E. coli but there's lots of them, that, those bacteria are actually good. They help you make vitamin B12. They also help you to make and absorb vitamin K. So they're not a negative thing. They populate the GI tract, the lower parts in that large intestine, and they actually help to do some sort of like modifications of materials that move into that area. So if you take vitamins that have what? Like, I'm not sure what like a probiotic kind of thing? So if you're taking those, so that all that is is it's in a pill, and as long as it dissolves and it is processed with food, then it will get absorbed. And so then the body has it for you. So vitamins help your, your cells do certain things. Vitamins don't provide energy. They're not like there's no calories to your vitamin pill because the vitamin B, vitamin A, vitamin C, all the different ones, we'll talk about them later. But those vitamins just actually help your cells do certain things better. So they're less of our cells not doing them Well, all of the vitamin Bs and Cs, those are water soluble. So if you eat too much, you just flush it out in your kidneys. Okay, like A, D, E, and K could potentially be, they're fat soluble. They could end up being toxic if you ate a ton of them. But most people, they're, all, they're, they're deficient. <laughs> very, very few people actually get more vitamins than they actually need. Most of the time we're deficient. So the bacteria, though, that live in the large intestine, they don't have a problem using lactose. But when they eat lactose, they ferment it. So when things get fermented, that produces gas. And so you start having gas molecules produced in the large intestine. So how do people describe they start to feel? Right? People say like 
feels like my stomach's like sticking out to here. Like they actually start to feel like the large intestine starts to fill with gas and it starts to make you feel really bloated. That's also going to give you gas. So you're going to have flatulence, which means you're going to fart. Okay. But the other thing besides gas that these bacteria make when they ferment lactose is they make acids and acids irritate the wall of the large intestine. So to combat that, the large intestine will do contractions that can oftentimes create intense cramping. Okay, so you can get stomach cramps. It can also push water into the large intestine to try and flush out whatever is causing this irritation. So that ends up giving you diarrhea. So all of those sensations are all because this sugar didn't get digested before it got into the large intestine. So people that are, and I don't know if you know anybody that has lactose intolerance, my friend in high school, her, her sister's lactose intolerance was so intense that she would like literally like not be mobile. She would like curl up in a ball. She would have such terrible, terrible cramps. She said it felt like someone was stabbing her. So like she avoided milk at all, at all costs. Like there is no way you could not pay her to eat or drink anything that had dairy in it. And I'm like, that's horrible. Cause like cheese is like a staple diet. <laughs> like that's, that's like one of the worst case scenarios I would say. So in this, not having dairy, not having lactose, that's, that's not the really big issue. The big issue is cutting dairy out of your diet means you're going to limit your intake of what? What is dairy? calcium. Okay. You really eat, we're, we are not bone eating creatures. You know, like my dogs, we have ribs and like if we give the dogs their, the little rib bones and they'd like, <laughs> so they're like, they will chomp and crush and like, they will like sit there for hours just chewing and chewing till they eat it. Well, they're ingesting calcium because they're ingesting actual bone. We don't do that. We're like, oh no, I don't want the bone. I want boneless chicken breasts, right? You don't even want like to look at the bone. <laughs> I want to have it like all away from any kind of bone. So that means like we have very limited calcium options other than dairy. Because all other animals do ingest bones. All other carnivores do, except for us. We really don't. So if you're lactose intolerant, you've really got to find another calcium source because, and this is especially true for females, estrogen is tightly linked to calcium absorption. So normally before you hit menopause, 50 is the average age of menopause. Some women have it earlier, some women later. Before that, your estrogen levels actually increase your ability to absorb all little bits of calcium from your diet. When you hit menopause, estrogen levels go down and your calcium absorption goes down as well. So even if you are a milk drinker or a dairy eater, you're not going to absorb as much calcium past 50. So for women, this puts you at very high risk for developing what? Not bone cancer, osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is the brittle bones because calcium is used to make your bones dense. Calcium is used to make those bones hard and strong like a rock. If you don't have a lot of calcium in your diet in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, when you get past 50, you're already going to start to lose. So if your level is already low, now you're going to go lower from there. So osteoporosis is a real factor for somebody that is lactose intolerant. So they used to just tell you, well, just take a Tums. Well, Tums is not very soluble. Like you'll, if you've ever taken, you know how they're real chalky tasting. There's not very soluble calcium. It's calcium carbonate. So it's not the best option because it's estimated that you only absorb maybe 20% of that. There are calcium like OSCAL. There are calcium supplements that you can take. And if you're lactose intolerant, you really want to do that. You really want to do like a daily supplement of something with calcium every day, especially in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, because you're trying to make your bones as dense and hard as possible so that when you go past 50, you're not going to start showing signs of osteoporosis because those are the things that cause like your bone spontaneous fractures happen to women in their 60s and 70s, all because they've lost calcium. They've lost that bone integrity. It's made those bones very brittle. And so they can just like literally like stepping, you can end up fracturing. So people like break bones in their ankles, the, their vertebrae fracture, they break a hip. Oftentimes it's because of loss of bone calcium has made that point in the hip very weak. 
And so that's what happens in that break. So that's just my like nutritionally, calcium is really important. So if you have this lactose intolerance, you really want to make sure that you find some place to get calcium in your diet. So what about this one? Albinism. So albinism is when you're missing this one enzyme. It's called tyrosinase. What this enzyme does though, is it helps you to form what's called melanin. Melanin is a pigment. This pigment is taken up by your skin. It is taken up by your hair. And this pigment is taken up by the irises, which creates color in the eyes. So somebody that has albinism, what do they look like? What does their skin look like with no pigment? Extremely pale, okay? So they're very pale skin. What about their hair? Uh-huh, it's like whitish blonde. Mm -hmm. And a true albino, what are the colors of their irises? They're red or pink. And I always think of like an Easter bunny, you know, like the little white Easter bunnies. Have you ever seen one? Okay, they're super cute. They are albino rabbits and their eyes are pink. So it's called the iris. Those are the colored portion of the eye. Having a pink iris makes them extremely sensitive to sunlight. So they really cannot go outside without sunglasses on because it's just like, it's just so, it's so bright. They don't have any kind of shading. What about this pale skin? Okay, so if they go out in the sun, melanin is a natural sunblock. So the amount of pigment on your skin indicates just how much sunblock ability your skin has. The darker your skin tone, the better sunblocking you have. The paler your skin tone, the less sunblocking. Now I'm not going to say that somebody with dark skin doesn't need to wear sunscreen, okay? Because you can still get a sunburn. <laughs> if you go out in the sun, even though you do have melanin, you can still get a sunburn, okay? So you still have that challenge of having to monitor that. But think about having no melanin, no sunblocking ability at all. So they can get sunburned in 15 minutes. So when they go outside, long pants, long sleeve shirt. Okay, a lot of times they even wear gloves because there's no pigments at all. Without constantly being aware, like they have like, I've seen somebody has like, the, like a really broad hat because they're like, you don't even wanna get like, you don't even think about some of this stuff. You're like, oh, I got a little sun on the back of my neck. No, that would be a sunburn, okay? Just like going to the grocery store kind of thing. That can like end up being an issue. So those sunburns increase the risk of developing what? What does this greatly increase their risk of? Skin cancer. So somebody that's an albino, that has albinism, can live a full life, but they have to be very careful about the amount of sun exposure that they have because they're at very high risk of skin cancer because they have no natural sun blocking ability. And it's from one enzyme, just like lactose intolerance. Now, the last two, the last two, unfortunately, are much more severe. The first one is called phenylketonuria. And so they call it P. I knew this happened. Okay. They call it PKU. And that's where those initials come from. When you were born, you were tested for this. This is one of the tests that they do as part of their routine heel stick. So before baby goes home, they draw blood and they do a bunch of tests. They test to see if you make this enzyme. So the enzyme, and you don't have to remember the names of these enzymes, but this enzyme, phenylalanine hydroxylase, what it does is it breaks down a certain component in proteins called phenylalanine. It's an amino acid. And so if normally, if you ingest, whether you're ingesting breast milk or formula as, an, as a newborn infant, if there's more phenylalanine than what your body needs, this enzyme breaks it down. If you don't have this enzyme though, then when you're ingesting this component in proteins, and it's going to, proteins are gonna be in all of the foods they're ingesting, that phenylalanine, that molecule begins to build. And in excessive amounts, it ends up having detrimental effects on neurological development. So with babies that had PKU, they would be born, they would look normal, 
They would have normal activity, good like little score, their normal weight, normal reactivity, all their little reflexes like, you know, you can like touch their cheeks and they root. You can like put your finger in their hand and they like grasp you, tickle the bottoms of their toes and their toes go out. So they do all of those startle, the startle reflexes, which are super fun, you know, like make them jump. All those things are normal at birth. Come back at four weeks, baby seems like you're doing okay, gaining weight, things aren't too bad. And then though, about eight weeks, reflexes are diminished. They're not, they're not nursing as strongly. They're less reactive to things and that seemed to progress over time. That molecule that wasn't broken down builds up, inhibits neurological development, and can lead to permanent neurological delay. So mental retardation or neurological def deficiencies. And that becomes a permanent factor. So they just saw babies that this happened to, and it was sort of like, well, why? So they finally figured out it's this one enzyme. You're missing this one enzyme, and it's creating this problem. So now you're tested for it. So when you're born, you're tested for it. And if you have PKU, they just tell your parents, this child has PKU, they have to go on a low phenylalanine diet. You have to give them a diet with very low phenylalanine because you can't break it down. So instead of being breastfed, instead of being formula fed, you're put on like a special low phenylalanine formula and you stay on that. When you wean, they can give you, or like when you start eating, so there's things with high in protein. So they're gonna try and give you certain proteins that don't have a lot of phenylalanine in it, and that'll also help to limit that. So you don't have any of the neurological symptoms. If you don't have the excessive reactant buildup, if, because you're not eating it, then you don't have this issue. So I don't see anybody, nobody has a Diet Coke in here. So, <laughs> so Diet Coke is really, is one that's the regular gray can Diet Coke. It is sweetened with aspartame. Aspartame is NutraSweet. And so it's sweetened with that and aspartame, one of the components in aspartame is phenylalanine. So if next time you have a Diet Coke bottle, if you look at it, it will actually have a warning. Phenylketonurics contains phenylalanine. So it's really saying like if your kid has PKU, this is not something that you want to give them. Okay, you don't have to do this for your lifetime because this really affects neurological development. They do tend to put you on like a lowered protein diet, like encourage you not to be eating excessive amounts of protein just because of that. But once your little brain's all developed, then it's not going to have these deficiencies because it's already there. So that's one, by doing this test, they went from having like a child that ends up being a non, you know, they can live independently to having somebody that's fine, lives a normal life. So understanding that difference. The last one, unfortunately, Tay-Sachs disease is a really important enzyme. So it doesn't look like it's all that important. <laughs> Hexaminidase A, but this is the, an enzyme that allows for neurological connections to be made. Without this enzyme, baby is born, initially looks fine, but within weeks you begin to see that there is a decline, so they start to lose reflexes, they stop responding, eventually they end up going blind because of loss of those neurological connections, muscular weakness, and this one actually ends up being fatal. So they typically don't live but a few years. So this is one that they do test for because as a parent, I think you would want to know that there was this. I think it's pretty traumatic that if you ever were told that with a newborn, that would be horrible. But it is one because that's a really important enzyme. In fact, it's estimated that somewhere around 50% of miscarriages are because there was a critical enzyme that was not there that was there was some kind of error and that enzyme's not being produced for your body. And then that means that some major thing couldn't happen. So baby never got to be able to grow to term because there was that deficiency. So that's just, there's estimated that there's somewhere around 20,000 enzymes in your body. Okay, a lot of them. And not having one sometimes doesn't make a huge difference. Like it's just lactose intolerance, but then there's others that having some really important ones involved in processes like metabolism, like making energy for the cell. If you don't have those enzymes, then there's no way that the cells are gonna survive. Okay, do pretty good. All right, so we're gonna do this last part. So this is identifying, so that's sort of like ends like all of the energy 
energy, entropy, enthalpy, speeding up reactions all the way to the catalyst type of things, rates of reaction. This middle part is like looking at types of reactions and identifying them. So there's four basic types, and then there's one special. So there's really kind of five, but your book kind of goes four and then tells you another one. So like, why don't you just call it five? <laughs> but so there's these four. So these first two are really the opposites of each other. So when you think of synthesis, what do you think of? If you're going to synthesize something, you're going to make something, okay? Think of synthesis as building. So in synthesis, we're going to have more reactants than products. So in this, A and B combine and form C. So you will always have more reactants, less products. They'll never be the same number on each side. So I might have two reactants, three reactants, four reactants, 20 reactants, but I'm going to have fewer products. So it might be that I have three and two. I could have five and three. It's just always more reactants, fewer products. And the idea is, is you're building things. So do you think this is energy requiring or energy producing? Yeah, if you build something, if you want to build something, it requires effort. It doesn't happen on its own, okay? So when I want to synthesize, I have to connect things. By connecting them, that means I have to form bonds. When you form bonds, energy is required. Like, so growth, okay? There's a little baby growing into the individual. It requires a lot of nutrients, sometimes entire boxes of cereal. <laughs> But lots of nutrients in order for those nutrients to be utilized to build structures, to build bone, to build muscle, to increase in size. Decomposition, though, it's like the flip of the coin. This is the opposite. Decomposition, when you think of something decomposing, you think of it breaking down, falling apart. Okay. So in this, can you see, in this, with decomposition, C breaks into A and B. So I started with the bigger thing, and now I have two smaller things. I might start with one thing and end up with 10 little things. If I have more products, fewer reactants, fewer reactants, more product. It doesn't have to be just one and two. I could have multiple numbers of reactants and products, but I'm going to have more products. So when things fall apart, bonds get broken. When bonds get broken, energy gets released. So these are energy producing reactions. So I think of things like digestion, right? I want to take this huge starch molecule and I'm going to break it into little pieces. When I break it into little pieces, I'm actually getting energy out. I can even take those sugar molecules and break them down. And that's how I make lots of energy called ATP. So it's a decomposition reaction. And you can just recognize it, just look at the number of reactants and the number of products. But what if I have the same number? What if I have the same number of reactants and products? So do you see in this, I have two reactants and two products in both of these? So they're equal. So these, they call them exchange reactions, but they're really different from each other. So the fourth, third and the fourth, a single displacement is really when you have a single swap that goes on. So in this one, if I have A and B, which would be a compound, and I have C, which would be an element. So in this, C swaps with A, and A is now all by itself. So I have kind of this one single swap that occurs. That's why they call it a single displacement. The bottom one, though, a double displacement. So in a double displacement, I have two compounds, and those two compounds swap partners. So in that bottom one, do you see where A combines with D, C combines with B? It's almost always the outside pairs and the inside pairs in a double displacement end up combining. But you can recognize this because you have two compounds making two different compounds. Single displacement, it'll be an element in a compound making an element in a compound. Okay, so let's see if you can pick them out. What's this one? 
First one all the way up the top. It is. Just count how many reactants, how many products. Two and one. So that means this is a synthesis. More reactants, fewer products. Do you see that I'm building? I put these two together. So I synthesized by making fewer products. What about the next one? How many on each side? Two and two. So I know if it's equal, do you see that I have two reactants, two products? If it's equal, then I know that this is a displacement. So is it a double or a single? This one's a double. So this one's a double displacement. I have two compounds that are swapping those chemical partners, making two other compounds. And if you look, can you see that barium is combining with the sulfate and the sodium is combining with the chlorine? to make those products. So sort of the outside pairs and the inside pairs. I'm not gonna ask you to complete the reactions and do that, but that's actually how that swapping is occurring. The outside pairs end up combining and the inside pairs end up combining in the reaction. What about this one? Al2CO33 forming Al2O3 and CO2. Decomposition, does everybody see that? I start off with something bigger and end up with two things. So that means it's breaking down, this is decomposition. What about the Fe3O4 iron oxide? This is a, it's a displacement because you see two and two. So is it a double or a single? It's a single. Can you see that it's a single? I have an element in a compound making a different element in a compound. So this is a single displacement. See the difference between a single displacement and a double displacement. Single displacement always has an element Double displacement's always two compounds. So remember that an element is just on the periodic table by itself. So like H2, hydrogen, and then Fe, those are elements. But Fe3O4, that's a compound because it's two elements combined. H2O is a compound. All right, what about the magnesium one? Synthesis. Magnesium and nitrogen, they're combining. They're synthesizing, they're building putting together the magnesium nitride, Cl2 and H2O making HCl and O2. It's two and two, so you know it's a displacement, right? So I know it's a displacement. Then you just have to look, are they two, two compounds or an element in a compound? Element in a compound, so that means that I know it's single. SN plus Cl2 makes SnCl4. This one's a synthesis. CaO and HCl make CaCl2 and H2O. It's a double. Mm -hmm. Two compounds making two different compounds. And then the last one, Fe plus O2 makes Fe2O3. Synthesis. You see two reactants make one product, so that's a synthesis. All right, I'll quit there, but there is, no, no, no. There's another one. So do this one, okay? Practice this one, practice identification of those four. We will do that first thing, not on Tuesday though. Everybody knows Tuesday is fall break. Monday and Tuesday, you do not have classes. That is fall break, so I will see Lab people on Wednesday, and I will see this class on Thursday, okay?